Hi, this is Dr. Michelle Robin with Small Changes, Big Shifts, Building Rhythm and Resilience. And I believe if you'll change one thing a month, one thing for the next 12 months, you'll change your life forever. Thanks for joining me on the journey. We'll be recording this conversation to share some of my wonderful friends with you who um, I so graciously, uh, or I don't graciously, or I reached out to them and every single one said yes, they would participate over the next four weeks, uh, Monday through Friday, as we encourage you. And um, you know me, I love the, I love a word nerd, celebrate, guide, connect, which provide hope. And so we're celebrating you for showing up today. We're celebrating your resilience in this unprecedented time. We're celebrating um, my friend John today, who will be uh, giving some inspiration to you. He's always extremely inspirational to me, so I know he will be inspirational to you. Um, so John, hey, I'm going to introduce you, then we'll get going here. So John O'Leary lived through worse than most can imagine, actually worse than what we're going through now. At age nine, a fire exploded and burned 100% of his 100% of his body with a 1% chance to live, 1% chance to live. He fought extraordinary odds. He endured, persevered, and survived. Largely uh, because of others, he emerged, served, and now he inspires millions of people around the world. John now lives to share the life-giving lessons from his story and the hope that it'll help spark the extraordinary possibility of your story. John, welcome to Rhythm and Resilience. Michelle, it is an honor, and, and I, the introduction you wrote was beautiful, in particular the fact that you said John survived, endured, and thrived, largely through, largely through the help of others. And so I just want all the listeners to know right now, uh, you're not about to hear an interview about a guy bragging on how great he is. Uh, I am going to brag about how great life is and how, in my mind, great God is, the universe is, one another is. But we are intended and made to be our brothers and sisters keepers. And so I am the result of a whole lot of people working for a cause far greater than themselves. And here we are today having this conversation. So I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. John, gosh, it's hard to believe we met about 10 years ago. Is that crazy how time flies? Yes, I'm aging. You're not. So you and I are going <laughs> to pass uh, like ships in the night here pretty soon. But, but yeah, it was 10 years ago. And we connected then and we remained friends ever since. It's a... Uh, it's rare that you find someone you meet in the professional space that as you get to know them, you look up to even more in the personal space. And that's how I feel about you, Michelle. Well, John, I go, it goes right back at you. And I, I want to I share with our listeners a part of your story I remember that I want you to tell them this is your story. Okay, John. And I was sharing this story this morning with somebody, as a matter of fact, giving some hope and encouragement to them as well. And John, I, what I remember most about your story is um, you were in the hospital and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. You're in the hospital and your mom and dad are coming down the hospital corridor. And I get, I am starting to tear up even telling the story. And um, you know, your dad's saying, where's my boy? Where's my boy, John? Right. But your mother comes to your side, John, and here you are 1% chance to live. And what I remember of the story, which I will remember every single time I talk to you, and even when I don't talk to you, is when your mother said, John, do you want to live? John, take the story from there, will you? So it's, it's the day I got burned. And so you're looking at an older version of that little boy today. I'm 43 years old, but at age nine, I was burned on 100% of my body. And 87% of those burns were third degree. So for my neck, you see my hands, uh, they've been amputated from the knuckles down. But from my neck to my toes, it's third degree. So the skin is not naturally mine. It's been grafted from my, my scalp. So she walks into this situation that is, you, you don't prepare for a pandemic. How can you? But at the same time, you don't prepare for individual crisis in your own life. How can you? So this, this middle class mother, this school teacher mother, this wonderful lady mother walks into this room and her nine-year-old is laying there with no skin and no clothes on. She walks right over to me. She takes my burned right hand in hers. She pats my head, Michelle, and she says, baby, I love you, which like just took, my, took all my thoughts away from me for a moment because I had been so worried how mad she was going to be because I burned down her house is, is my nine-year-old rationale. And now I realize she's not mad about the house, she's worried about me. And it changed my whole perspective. So I looked up at her and I said, mom, am I gonna die? And uh, her response was, baby, do you wanna die? Do you wanna die? It's your choice, it's not mine. And I said, mama, I don't wanna die, I wanna live. And her response was, good. Then baby, look at me. You take the hand of God, you walk the journey with God and you fight 
like you never fought ever before. Your father and I will be with you. You're not on your own, but you got to choose this thing. And so that, that was like page one of this story, story forward. I think it's page one of all of our stories forward. Like you, you got to make a decision in spite of the headwind and economic crisis and pandemic blowing its wind toward us. How do we choose to opt into this thing? How do, how do we choose to take the next best step? Uh, we chose life. And um, it's been a difficult journey for the five months in hospital, through amputations, through dozens of surgery, years of therapy, a lifetime of some challenges. But it's a choice I make even today in April 2020, a choice to live boldly today. Well, John, there's so much to the story and our listeners can find it and they can hear more about it. And we're going to get to more of that story. But really, I want to I really want to dive into today. And I was listening to um, one of the podcasts I listened to Elevate Church today. And it said, stop wasting today's strength on tomorrow's battle. Woo. And I, th- I think about the battle that you had to endure. How many days were you in the hospital, John? Well, so let me just say this, Michelle. Anytime I'm on a podcast or listening or hosting, I'm always looking for like the bumper sticker moment. Like the thing where if you had a couple beers this afternoon, you might go to a tattoo parlor and put it on your right bicep. Uh, that right there, what you just said right there was one of them. Don't waste, and I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, today's strength on tomorrow's battles. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, stop wasting today's strength on tomorrow's battles. And where are we spending our strength today? It's almost entirely on tomorrow. Whether that's Tuesday, way down the future, or next Tuesday, or three months, or 12, like – our whole vision is going away from where we are today into what might happen tomorrow. And I had a conversation earlier with a friend of mine who says, you either get to live in faith or fear, and you can't do it both at the same time. Very similar uh, sentiment. So uh, you, you asked about how long I was in hospital. I was in for five months, and I'm nine years old. I see some little kids on the screen right now, so I'm probably about one of their ages. I'm a nine-year-old boy. I'd never spent a night away from my mom and dad before then. I'm not I'm not an adventurous little guy like that. So I'd never been anywhere. And now I'm spending night after night, then week after week, living somewhere where I did not want to be. But what in part helped me get through that, two things. Number one was this big, bold vision for tomorrow. Not a negative one. Not a vision of death and headwind and recession and misery. The vision that we are being fed in the media and in social media today. That was not the vision. The vision I had was a vision of homecoming a vision of reunion, a vision of health, a vision of life, and a vision of possibility. So that's one It was this grandiose vision of where we were going together. And then secondly, this idea of living present in the time that we had. We, we, uh, we waste a lot of our energy on tomorrow, Michelle, as you know. And so I, I was blessed to invent myself as a little boy in being highly focused on where I was right then. And by the way, when you're focused on where you are now, it's actually usually full of a lot of joy. Like, I'm drinking a little ice water right now out of my teacup. But as you were doing the, the introduction, I took a sip of this and thought, my God, this water is so good. Like, little baby joy that you miss if you're focused on the, on the misery of tomorrow. So I'm trying to live present in the joy of the day. And it's, if you're there for it, it's everywhere around you. It's in the flower and magnolias out many of our doorways right now. John, I, I'm thinking about, and, and just so our listeners know, we did not prep for this conversation um, we are just our friends from the last 10 years. We actually have, I saw you, John, maybe two years ago when I was in St. Louis, we exchanged texts and emails, you know, about uh, two or three times a quarter. But John, what I'm thinking about is five months. So, so let's say I'm, I'm thinking about the future for just a moment, John, I'm thinking about your five months and all of a sudden my, my five months or whatever it looks like looks a ton better than five months. Cause if I remember your story, John, John, were you laying face down? most of the time in a hospital bed for five months? It was one or the other. So when they were doing skin grafts on the back of my body or my my rear end or the back of my legs, skin won't grow if you're laying on that part. So they flip you over like a little pancake. So usually a couple of weeks at a time, I would be on my belly or a couple of weeks at a time, I'd be on my back. But either way, I'm an adventurous, athletic, little baseball playing nine-year-old who is now tied down to a hospital bed for five months. Wow. What, 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 a, what, a, what a story you have. And once again, our listeners can t- uh, find you more um, online and on your podcast, Rising Above. Rising Above. But let, let, me, let me also say this. What if the little boy could just shut his eyes and wake up five months later? And, uh, and what if you could to do, that, to do that today? Because I think, and Michelle, you hinted at this, we're a month into this storm. I think in four months, we're on the backside of the storm clouds. 
I think there are additional storm clouds to come. I don't know what they are, and you don't know what they are individually. Who knows the future? But we have this moment right now to kind of imagine ourselves being four m months out now from where we are, and imagine what lessons we've learned through the previous five months of, of storm dancing. And, and my, my greatest hero in my life was my grandfather. He was a World War II veteran. He's a farm boy. He became um, an attorney. Before he did that, he fought in, in the Pacific in World War II. He married his sweetheart, just like the greatest generation story. But I remember he told me one time, because I read Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. So I was grilling my grandpa about this. And his response was this, John, what made us the greatest generation was not that we endured the depression or that we went off to war. What made us the greatest generation is we never forgot the lessons we learned along the way. So Michelle Robbins family and followers and listeners, I think there's something to be said about this storm that we are enduring right now. One month in, maybe four months or so to come, who knows? What lessons are we learning that we can put into play in our businesses, in our finances, in our spiritual life, in our emotional and health life that we can use to redeem the situation, to make us far better versions of ourselves once the storm cloud passes? What can we learn right now during a very painful season so that we can become the next greatest generation? It wasn't the depression or World War II. It was the fact that they were redeemed through these situations. They were made better and bolder because of them. Without a doubt, one of the questions I did kind of think about preparing was kind of what was your biggest struggle before COVID? I'm curious, what was the biggest challenge you had before COVID? It's, it's the exact opposite of the one today. My biggest struggle before COVID was busyness. I'm a, I'm a motivational speaker. I travel the world. I'm an author, podcast host, do a lot of shows on television and radio. And in my spare time, I'm a dad of four little kids. And I'm a husband of one and I'm a son of a mom and dad. I have their pictures all, all over the screen right behind you guys right now. My dad has Parkinson's disease. He's had it for 33 years. My mom is his caretaker. They're my heroes, but they need my help. And so it's managing all these responsibilities and feeling like I don't have enough time in the day. And now, Michelle, it's the exact opposite. I have lots of freedom and lots of time. 33 consecutive dinners at home. I haven't had 33 dinners with my wife in more than 13 years. And I'm sad about the loss of work and the loss of the ability to travel the world and really what I feel called to do. But I'm grateful for a period of time that I have been forced to slow down and not miss what is directly in front of me. And so uh, I was telling a friend recently that a, a lot of people are referring to this as Groundhog Day, just Groundhog Day. And my, my counter to that was, you know, yeah, I get it. But Bill Murray also learned how to play the piano during that time. Bill Murray also learned French during that time. And Bill Murray also learned how to become a much better version of himself during that time. So we can all complain away these days and talk about how crappy everything is and your neighbors will nod their head and agree with you. Everybody will. Or we can learn the piano. We can learn guitar. We can learn a new language. We can call friends we haven't spoken to in years. We can write a love letter every day to a new friend. There's opportunity to become a brothers and sisters keeper right now in a marketplace that is building walls. So I, I just think this can be a period of time that you would not have chosen. It has chosen you. And what do you want to do with it? My dogs were saying hello because they were green. They were high-fiving you, John, on that. Um, John, it's so fascinating to hear you say that. And I actually had a feeling you were going to say that the gift, one of the gifts you got was time right now with your families. And speaking of the piano, by the way, John is uh, an amazing piano player, despite not having his fingers. Um, oh, he He's amazing at it, and I wish you had a piano in that room which put you up on that. Um, so, John, when you think about resilience, I, I like to say that we have to find a rhythm so we can have resilience during this universal reset. Because mm. I do believe we're resetting on many levels. I know I'm resetting. I'm, I'm, I would say what's kept me up a few nights the last few weeks is, is am I going to have the courage to shift my life Yes. The way that my heart's calling me versus just going back to the same old, same old. So that's a, that's what's stirring in my heart. And so I'm curious for you, um, what uh, problem have you had to solve with creativity right now? Because you you know you you're, you're on the road a lot. You're 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 a paid motivational speaker, by the way, one of the best in the world. So I want to tell you, you guys are in it for an you have an amazing treat today getting to have one of the best in the world. And I've heard many speakers, and John is by far one of the best. So what is, how are you creatively solving some of the problems you have with your business? I'll answer that by stepping into it kind of sideways. The, the first, I always build my life and my calendar around what matters most. And so the first thing I got to figure out is how do I solve the problems that are happening at home? 
Uh, so last night I brought my mom and dad dinner. I dropped it off, scooted across the doorway, and we had a nice hour and a half conversation, me about 10 feet away from my heroes. And I'm busy too. Even during this time of, of COVID-19, I, like, I, don't, I don't have time for that. Except life's too important not to make time for the things that actually matter. So uh, we make time for things that actually matter to us. So I got to hang out with my incredible mom and dad last night. And if you ask any other questions around them, I'll, I'll just start openly crying because they are amazing people. The reason I was 42 seconds late for our interview for this is because I went home today at 11 o'clock and homeschooled my kids for a little bit. My little Grace is eight years old. She has blonde hair and purple rim glasses. And as I was ready to run back to your interview, she says, Dad, will you play me in ping pong? I don't have time for you, Grace, to play you in ping pong. But we made time. And, and so it's creatively saying yes to the things that matter most so that you can also live a life that actually has meaning long term. And so I'm practicing now what I want to live into five months from now, Michelle. Your original question was around business, though. I have seven colleagues I work with, and primarily our revenue stream is from John O'Leary being on the road, speaking at large conferences. I don't know about you, but you can't even get together with more than two people these days. So it's not the stadiums are not full anymore. So how do you pivot an entire business model that was built one way into a way where you remain highly committed to keep everybody employed. So my, I'm not trying to just endure this. I want to grow through the season, and I want to keep wonderful ladies and gentlemen employed during a season where everybody else is furloughed. I, I really want to keep them gainfully employed. And so we are pivoting dramatically into digital media, into webcasts, into coaching, into things that we'd never done before because we were too busy speaking. And now we have a lot more time to create high-level content that is available online, through our studio channel, we're creating a wet, we're creating a whole new television show, actually. So uh, it has forced us to think way outside the box. And that's one of the beautiful things that always comes out of necessity. Like it, it demands when, when in 1963, September 12th, when JFK stood at Rice University and said, by the end of this decade, we're going to go to the moon and return safely. Many of the alloys weren't even invented for the shuttle mission yet. The vast majority of the technology that would take them to the moon and back weren't invented yet. But the vision was set that this is where we were going. And so sometimes when you just put a flag way out there in the distance and you say, people, that's where we're going. I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to get there together. And when we get there, we're going to become better versions of ourselves because of it. And we're going to touch lives along the way. That's the greatest challenge we face. But I also think it's the greatest opportunity in our business and in our society right now. Oh, that was a lot to unpack right there, John. But I, I'm thinking about connection and, you know, my business is called Your Wellness Connection and how do we reconnect? And, and I remember sitting um, in, in my old office, so it's been about uh, 24 years ago or so, and thinking of the name Your Wellness Connection. Think about how do we help people reconnect back to themselves? And, and boy, are we having time to do that now. What are some things you're doing differently today to reconnect at a deeper level? John, I know you're a man of faith. I, I've witnessed it. Um, I hear it every time we talk. Is there anything you're doing differently in this time? Let, let me tell you what I'm doing during this time. And some of it's new and some of it's just uh, lessons learned along the way. But I think part of the wisdom of those of us who've been through real challenges and come out maybe even stronger because of them is hopefully you don't forget. Yeah. It's a way if you've been through cancer or bankruptcy or a painful relationship that went sideways or whatever it might've been, we can become resentful and um, irredeemable, like just kind of remain in the gutter. Or you can learn from what happened to you, choose not to go back that way, but also choose to grow in compassion, faithfulness, gratitude, connection to the things and the people that matter to you. And so some things that I've been doing for years now, Michelle, whether the sun was shining brightly on me or it seemed like it was buried behind clouds, is I wake up about an hour before anybody else in my family. Uh, it's, in my family, that's pretty early. So I'm up about an hour before anybody else. I make a cup of tea or coffee, I, feel a, I learned this from you, a big, huge jug of water, and I go outside, whether it's 67 and sunny or uh, 31 and frigid, and I, I sit there with a journal, uh, I, and I wait for the east clouds to break, and then on the eastern horizon, there's always this moment, uh, and it's when the sun cuts through the darkness, and, and from, I, I get emotional even thinking about it, like the whole world is dark. The Wall Street Journal and nobody else has a clue what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody, don't kid yourself, they don't know. And then to the east, and it's a miracle that happens every morning if your eyes are trained to look for it. The light cuts through the darkness and the miracle of light returns. The miracle of opportunity and hope and promise returns to your life. And so I capture that every morning with my own eyes. I have a journal in front of me and I make a list of things I'm grateful for. Sometimes that is a prayer 
Sometimes it's a list of names. Sometimes it's a love letter to a parent or to a spouse or to a neighbor. Uh, sometimes it's recognizing how incredible nature is. I mean, it's, it's so incredible. And yet in the busy, business of life, how frequently we miss it. And how, mo- how most of us this year have captured the essence of spring, something you probably haven't really noticed since you were a kid. So I, I begin every day gratefully and prayerfully, essentially on my knees, looking east, saying, why me, God? Why me? And I make a list of it. I track it. And then when I struggle, Michelle, I read back through those notes. So that for me, that's been very helpful. One of the things that came out of that was in 2017, I started making a list of things I was grateful for for my wife. In marriage, in partnerships, with roommates, with kids. I see a couple of kids in the background. People can grind on you. Even the best among us can be ground on by the people we are supposed to love the most. And I find the people we are supposed to love the most are the ones we take most for granted. Almost always, almost universally. So in 2017, on January 1, I wrote my wife a love letter, acknowledging how frequently I missed the things she was doing for me and how I did not want to miss it today. And then on January 2, I did that again. And January 3, I did the third time and then the fourth time. And I never told her what I was doing. I just kept a year's worth of journal entries for my wife. And then on Christmas morning that year, December 25th, 2017, I gave her this big, fat, leather-bound journal of love letters and movie tickets and airline tickets, napkins from a cocktail date we had out together, like little milestones together throughout the season of life. And I'm the worst gift giver. <laughs> I, give, uh, I gave her a red dress one year that was totally wrong. I gave her a lawnmower one year that was totally off base. Like, I gave her the worst gifts. But that year, I gave her this awesome gift that she could not only read that day, but when we struggle in marriage, she can go back to and be reminded of how loved she is. So the cool thing about gratitude is it not only opens your eyes to what's everywhere around you, because it's there. You don't have to see it. The headlines don't, but it's everywhere around you. The other thing it does is it reminds you when you are struggling how good your life was and how good it is and how good it can become again in the future. So, John, I believe everybody here is thinking, gosh, you know what? I think I want him as my husband. So, so <laughs> mine just gets, I, I'm getting some amens on that or, or, or higher. Mark in case for you, Mark on the phone, we take him as your wife, but, <laughs> but how, how, how do we show up more gratitude? It's interesting. I started to practice um, this year, January, actually December 28th, 2019. And I'm using the five minute journal app. Those people that are in my practice have heard me talk about it, but it's a five minute journal app. A couple reasons why um, a, it's always with me on my phone. And then B, um, I have horrible penmanship and, and I'm sitting here complaining about my penmanship to you, John. I have no idea how your penmanship is. And, um, and I like to be able to read it later and I have trouble doing that. And so Dr. Maria might understand that being a physician and you're just sort of thinking so fast. So I, I can read it later. And I actually did it today. And one of, the, one of my um, gratitudes today was, uh, and, and what was going to make today great. So it has three questions in the morning. What are you grateful for? Um, What are you going to do to make today great? Which I think is as important question. And then an affirmation. And one was have a great conversation with you and inspire our friends here who, and give them hope. The whole message I like to always share, celebrate, guide, connect, hope. We share that on my podcast, small changes, big shifts. Mm -hmm. So John, thinking about the word hope, Mm. what are some words of hope somebody has given you during this time? Jeez. Thank you. I love you. (laughs) I see you. You're not alone. Your work matters. Uh, oh, I've been amazed, Michelle, as I'm sure you are as well, at, at how many people reach out to me randomly and say, I bet this has been a hard time on you. You know, like my business is almost like the cruise lines. Like if you hear like they're not sailing, well, neither are the speakers. They're not sailing either. And I, I love the work I do. I don't do it for the money or the affirmation. But to get affirmation from whether they're executives or they were custodians working in the back of the room at one of your events, that's probably the most meaningful letter I've received from a custodian currently between work right now who connected with me in San Diego, and we've remained connected for four years. And this guy said, man, I bet this is hard for you. I wanted you to know that your work matters and it will return. Uh, So I think affirmation during seasons like this is really important for all of us, even those who seem like they have it all put together because none of us do. None of us do. You know, one thing, I'm actually at our lake house right now. I stepped out of my practice for two weeks. I also watched my practice go from being, you know, at best year ever to, yeah. to about 30%. And we, my partners were there and it was like, okay, well, I could step out for a bit. Plus, you know, you want, don't want to be that person that give, is, is sharing COVID. So um, I'm in, I'm in a, on day nine of uh, 14 days of isolation right now. Um, at, fortunate enough to be um, at Table Rock Lake. 
Um, I brought my, my home computer with me. I got a little light here, got a little prayo in the background to make my stage. Um, and, and John, it has been, it has been, it has been a fascinating season. Our friend Tom Hill says, be fascinated, not frustrated. Mm. And so that fascination of the, and the stress of having to, you know, watch things shift. And so, um, you know, I love the word shift. So John M, what words of hope are you giving? Mm. Like one thing, one thing I'm doing is I actually brought with me about a hundred note cards with stamps already. And so I sent out a hundred notes. I actually walked the mile and a half to the um, post office today and put them in the box with gloves, by the way, just so you know, and then walked back. So um, that's one thing I'm doing is I'm taking time to, to jot a note. Yes, it's not great penmanship, but it, it's from my heart. So, mm -hmm. so what kind of hope are you sprinkling intentionally? Well, I think there's hope that you sprinkle into your own life. There's hope you sprinkle into those that you love most life. And then there's hope you sprinkle into the universe of people that you don't even know if you'll ever meet them face to face, but you want them to be encouraged that their life has value and that their best days are in front of them. Michelle, in, in 2018, the stock, mar stock market was at historic highs. Unemployment was at historic lows. So these are two bellwethers of how we're doing as a world. And 1.5 million Americans attempted suicide. And that, and that was when things were good. That was when COVID-19 was never heard of. And that's when the idea of being between jobs, how could you? We got the Trump bump, baby. Everything is good. We got, we got this thing figured out. Life is awesome. 1.5 million of us attempted suicide. And so what I'm highly aware of these days is how much encouragement and love and affirmation and togetherness is needed in a world where we are being told and mandated to build higher walls. And so I'm doing my very best to knock them down uh, personally, but also professionally. I have a bit of a platform, so we have a nice following. And so I'm using that every day, every single day to provide encouragement, to, to provide a, a face that I hope is loving and reflects possibility, to answer questions, to reflect possibility. So that's part of what we're doing. I also, like you, I write a lot of handwritten notes. I also send out a lot of video notes. So uh, I'm just going through my phone and about... I don't know, five different people a day. I'll just randomly send a little video love to. I just, hey, Michelle, it's John. You came across my mind today. I just wanted you to know, I think you're beautiful. I think your work matters. And I think you're awesome. If you ever need anything, I'm first in line. And then hit send and do it again and again and again. And I really mean it. Uh, I think a lot of people are trying to monetize this crisis in one way or another. I'm trying to weather it, but I, I don't want to make money on it. I just want to get through it together. And I think people will remember, for those of you who are operating your own business right now, and you're, maybe you're struggling, uh, they will remember the people who are investing in them and not asking for anything in return. So I'm just trying to love people and be an encouragement. First, it, to the guy in the mirror, he needs it too. But then to my little ones, I have four kids who are scared right now. I have a wife who is working part-time and trying to figure out how do I work part-time and manage homeschooling four kids. I've got a father and a mother who are at risk of COVID-19 at a high level. My father's lung capacity is very weak and my mother has her own health issues. So I'm, I'm trying to love those closest to me, but also trying to reach out to neighbors. Uh, we're all trying to get through this thing together. It's odd that a crisis would affect all of us. And yet this one has. And so uh, for those of us who have the means, I think we should actively seek to be difference makers in the marketplace looking for it. And anybody can lock their doors and hide away. Uh, I think we are called somehow in one way or another to actually unlock them, open them wide and say, let's do it together. Let's do it together. That may not be bringing people wildly off the street, but it might mean when you go grocery shopping or you order online that you think of ways that you can send canned goods out to marketplaces that are starving for it. I have a little brother named, named Travion. What we know about those who live in, in some of these environments is that PTSD is rampant in these communities that a lot of the dads are coming home and a lot of abuse is skyrocketing that a lot of these kids get breakfast and lunch at school and now the schools are closed down. So this is a crisis that is affecting people like me and you, but it is dramatically affecting those who are considered by many least among us. So uh, we got, we got to reach out and love them in ways that are unique and, and personal just to them, but we can be part of that. John, that's probably one of what's got my heart the most is these kids that are um, at home in possibly abusive situations or spouses that are in abusive situations. So we have to continue to pray for them. John, and, and to our followers, we're going to, if you want to type any questions, now's a good time to do that. We're going to start to um, go to our question segment here in a little bit. But as you can tell, John is an amazing storyteller. 
And John, the other story I think about is um, I'm thinking about heroes and, and we all have heroes and sheroes in our lives, the people, and it could be, it could be the person that uh, is at the grocery store who looks you in the eye every time and serves you with, with so right. much love. Um, John, you have, you mentioned your parents and, and without a doubt, and, and I want our listeners to get your book while you've got time right now, um, get John's mom's book. First of all, that's the first <laughs> book to read and then read John's book. Cause that's what uh, called him into some of the work he's doing. John, John, tell the story about uh, Mr. Buck. Can oh. you tell the story about Mr. Buck? Yeah, and I, his picture's up on the wall right behind you again. But the, the context is this. Jack Buck was a radio announcer in the Midwest. He's a Hall of Famer. He's in seven different Hall of Fames. So you may not have heard of Jack Buck, but you would have probably heard of his son, Joe Buck. He calls the Super Bowls. He calls the World Series. He's a celebrity. I really like Joe Buck a lot, but I loved his dad. Because dad was broadcasting during my era, the late 70s and 80s. I got burned in 1987. Michelle, I'm tied down to the hospital bed. I can't move. I can't see because my eyes are swollen shut. And I can't talk because they have me trait. You know, you hear about these respirators. Now, well, I was on one for months in the hospital. I, I, I get the need for oxygen. I, I had that myself. And I can't do anything as a child. But I, I could pray and dream and have hope and I could listen. And uh, the day after I got burned, Jack Buck came into this room, and uh, I'll never forget when he walked in, and the first thing he said was, kid, wake up. Wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. And then he said, see you soon. He walked out of that room. He was told by the staff that the little boy he just visited was going to die. There's no reason for hope. He leaves that room, and when you get a diagnosis like that, Michelle, Robin, in class, many of us just believe it. Many of us believe that the best days are behind us. That's what you heard night after night for the last four and a half weeks. Jack took it home. This is a greatest generation guy. He never forgot the lessons, though, that were imparted in, in him during that time. So the following day, a little boy named John O'Leary in a hopeless situation tied down to a hospital bed is dying, the world thinks. And then one guy cuts through the darkness. He opens up the door, walks back in, and he says, kid, wake up. Wake up. You are going to live. And it's a much longer, more beautiful story than I think we have time for. But this man considered those, he kept those visits going for the five months I was in hospital every day visiting me. When he left eventually for spring training, he would send the football Cardinals at the time in his place. Every night he would talk about it on the radio saying, how's my little, my little kid, John O'Leary? fighting for his life in a hospital bed in St. Louis. We're thinking about you and we're praying for you, kid. And as a little boy, hearing that voice night after night, encouragement matters. Despair matters too. It will have an equal effect on your life. One will bring you down, the other one will bring you up. Choose wisely in what you tune in into. Really, like this, is, this is big. Your choice to tune into Michelle's program is wise because most programs out there are encouraging death right now. They're telling you how bad things are and they're going to tell you more at 10. Jack was telling me how good things are and it's going to get better. Fight for it, though. Fight for it. We fought for five months. Eventually, he taught me how to write, again, by sending me baseballs. Uh, every baseball came with a note that said, kid, if you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the guy who signed the first. So this man not only kept the promise of John O'Leary Day at the ballpark, he sent me a baseball, then a second baseball, then a third baseball. And by the end of the summer, he sent over 60 baseballs to a little guy with no fingers teaching him a little bit of penmanship, Michelle, teaching him how to write again, teaching me how to move forward into life again. And uh, long story made shorter, when I graduated university, he sent uh, a package at a note, and inside the package was the baseball that he received when he went into the Hall of Fame. So here I am, a 22-year-old college drunk finance major with no clue what to do in my life. And this Hall of Fame human being sends – a little nobody named John O'Leary. Nobody's ever going to hear from that guy teaching this little boy that his life had value, uh, given probably the most priceless possession he had away and never told a soul about it. So uh, when I had my own child, my firstborn, his name is Jack. We named him after someone who <clears throat> imparted love on me. And listen, you don't need to be a Hall of Famer or a business owner to radically change somebody's life. You mentioned the grocery checker. Like the way they look into your eyes can influence how you feel downstream from that day. The way a barista serves you a coffee can radically change the morning that unfolds in front of you. We have the ability. You don't, you don't have to use it, 
but you have the ability to profi- profoundly shape someone else's life. We call it the butterfly effect. And it's real. And I, I think if we on this call, Michelle, can inspire a couple hundred people to pick it up and use it, we can change the world. We can use the coronavirus for something far greater than the death that it's currently causing. And that's not to diminish this pain, because this is painful. This is sad. And yet, so one of my favorite words, like sentences, and yet, and yet. So rather than ending everything with a period or a but, uh, and yet, what, what can we do to ensure that uh, it's not wasted? I'm curious for the people on the call with us today is, is what's your and yet? And I'd love to hear from you. Help us, if you feel called, don't feel no pressure. You could just show up every day or not show up. But help us make the shift because we've got to get the good news out there. We've got to get the good news out there. And, and we are going to, uh, I know I'm going to be better on the other side of this. I know it. I believe it. I have faith in it. doesn't mean I don't suck my thumb for a few moments. I'm not sucking my thumb all day anymore. I have moments. And then I say, okay, I put on a podcast or I, I grab a book or I text a friend or I get outside of myself. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on again. So, so if you have questions, now's a great time to write it. Uh, John, John, this is a question that um, my friend Mary Beth Gentry made me think about. She's, she runs a group of uh, girls in Wyandotte County, which is one of the poorest counties, not in Kansas, in the country, by yes. the way. Yes. It's in the top, like, top five of um, infant mortality. But uh, she shares, and she, she's not able to get in front of her girls right now. And, but she said this to me this week. I'm kind of doing a little call with her and her team uh, daily. And she said, what, we all have medicine to share. So for our listeners, and, and, and John, I, I believe part of your medicine, medicine is giving hope and inspiration and encouragement. What am I missing there? What other medicine do you give that I don't know about yet? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always find what you choose to focus on expands. And so, Michelle, I'm not a big like, reader of bad news. Like, I, I just realized for a long time the media's primary job is to sell ad space. If you think they're there to tell you the truth, and this is not a political statement, I'm not saying I'm a Republican or Democrat by saying this, but I'm telling you this right now. They are there to sell commercials. Please understand that. Please understand that. In 2017, 90, this is when everything was good, supposedly, 94% of news stories were negative. This according to Harvard Business Review. 94% of news stories in a very healthy period of society were negative. So if you think this is new, it's not. There were words written 2,700 years ago. They, they apply today. The words are these. There is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new, new under the sun. So if you think this COVID-19 thing is all, it's never been like this before. There's nothing new under the sun. So what do we choose to focus on right now? When I began focusing on COVID-19, and I did as my business fell apart, and as we had to tighten our belt at home, and as we had to make some really difficult decisions, uh, I was having nightmares. I don't have night. I never had nightmares, even when I was in the hospital. So I've never had nightmares. And then for the first week and a half, I was waking up every night, like in tears, thinking how crappy everything is and how bad it is out there. And, and then I stopped reading every headline. And I stopped becoming an expert on what's happening in Italy and Spain, things I don't have a whole lot of influence over right now anyway. And I started owning my own little garden in the backyard, things that I can control, what I can do for Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Eastern Missouri. Can I make a difference for you guys as you try to get lunch out there to these kids in crisis mode? I can do something here. I can't help in Spain right now. We'll come there later on. So I'm trying to focus on the things that I can do. It's allowing a whole lot of that negativity to dissipate. And it is amazing how empowering it is to realize you can't change the world, but you can change parts of it. And so I'm not worried so much right now about what's happening everywhere, but I'm very, very, very worried worried what's happening in my part of it. And rather than complaining about it, uh, I'm trying to solve for it. So that's one thing maybe you should know. Another thing you should know is as a guy who is ferociously optimistic, I'm trying to see the silver lining while it's, while it's pouring out right now. And I'm trying to grow in my faith. This is for, for us in our faith walk. This is, this is Holy week. This is a week, in other words, about a, a, a God man who enters in as a champion of the people and by the end of the week will be crucified. He'll die. And yet within three days, the tomb will be empty and he walks out redeemed. And so I, it reminds me of these wild rides that we take in our marriages and in our singleness and in our partnerships and in our life and in our health and in our 401ks and a society. And yet eventually in my faith walk, the tomb gets emptied. The, the rock gets rolled back and the sunlight returns like that. 
that just gets me through some really, really, really difficult dark days. I know how the story ends. So I don't need to be overly negative as we endure the Good Fridays that get us toward it. So that's also helpful for me. And maybe the final thing is, like you, I'm pivoting in full tilt. We, uh, you mentioned the book On Fire. We've got another book coming out in a month. It's called In Awe. In Awe, I wrote it about a year and a half ago. It's about returning to the childlike wonder we once all possessed, which is to say when you believed that life was good, when you were able to hold the hand of someone who looked very different than you, when you're able to look at people who had different skin tone, ask a question, and once they say, well, I'm just born that way, it's behind you. When you were able to be less judgmental, not only about others, but about yourself. When the ego wasn't yet in the room, when you believed that anything was possible and each day you were proving it out. And so I wrote this book for a, a time when I thought we needed to slow down and recognize how good life is. And now we're in it. Wow. And now we're in this moment where we can choose to curse the rain or we can put on a swimsuit and dance in it. I, I drove to work last Tuesday um, and it was 54 degrees in St. Louis, similar weather, weather pattern at Kansas City. There were kids in the front yard next door to me running through the sprinkler. The little girl had a two-piece on. The little boy had his swim trunks on. Mom was probably inside losing her mind, homeschooling five kids. But two of them were outside, probably without her permission, running through the spring. But it's 54. Having the time of their life, people. So we can curse the cold weather. We can curse what's happening around us. Or you can get your swimsuit and go dance in it. Your choice. Dancing in the rain. Well, we, we, have, a, we have a couple questions. But it makes me think of, I just interviewed um, Austin Perlmutter, who's an MD. And he used an acronym of time. T, kind of limit your time on television, yes. social media. You know, I, be intentional. M, be mindful. Um, I don't remember E right now. So we'll, we'll just stop at that. But there's, there's a question from um, Eleanor. What book are you reading right now? So we're, we're reading the, the book called In Awe. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to hold this up. Because every day I'm reading this little book to my kids. On the front of the book, and at first when they, when they produced the very first cover they had, I think this is funny. The very first cover they had, they sent it back to me. These are guys in New York. And it was a picture of John O'Leary on the cover with a tie on. I hate ties. So I'm wearing a tie, and I, I'm like this. <laughs> so then I emailed back, did you guys read the book? Did you read the book? So they're like, um, yeah. so anyway, they, they then sent me back a copy that was very professionalized. And uh, – I'm like, did you guys read the book? So then finally they sent me back this cover with a big, happy, brilliant, bright blue sky on it. And this little red kite, no hands, no, no, no skin color, no, none of this stuff that separates. Just this evidence of light and possibility and freedom and hope and play. So I wrote back, I think, you're, I think you guys got it. So I'm, I'm reading this book right now to my kids. It's the first book I ever wrote was dedicated to my wife. And it begins the book on fire like that. Thank you for choosing to take my hands the night we first met, which is true. And my hands don't look like anybody else's hands. So the fact that a 19 year old girl who remains the prettiest girl I've ever met decided to take the hands of a guy who is radically different than anybody else speaks not to me, but to her. Like that's her heart, Michelle. She's just an amazing woman. So I said, thank you for taking my hand back then and for taking it every day for the last 18 years. Like, you know, and then I went on from there. But, but this book is dedicated to my kids. They haven't read it yet. So it's releasing in three weeks. And so every night I sit around the dinner table and I read them one more little section of this book that I wrote for them. And um, I'm just going to read you the introduction right now because I think it speaks to what we all feel, I think at least. So here's the introduction. To the little ones who ensured my life would never be the same. Jack, Patrick, Henry, and Grace. Because of you, I am more daring, I am more loving, and I am more alive. Let this book remind you always of all you taught me and how much I love you. And my children, as the years pass and you forget to live these lessons yourself, because they will. We adults always forget. Let this book remind you to reclaim what remains possible always within you. And then below that is a little quote from Nancy Tillman. She wrote the, the beautiful book on the night you were born. And it says this. So uh, kids listening right now, whether you are 9 and 11 on Angela's screen or you are 64 on someone else's screen. So children... We still, that little one is still within you. That little one that wants to fly a kite and run through the sprinkler, she's still there. Let her out, put on the two-piece. Here are Nancy Tillman's words to you. 
on the night you were born. The moon smiled with such wonder that the stars peeked in to see you. And the night wind whispered, life will never be the same. Life will never be the same. The likelihood of us being on this call and in this room and on this earth, it was scientifically studied, the likelihood of your father and your mother connecting at just the right moment. We'll leave the science class right there. We won't go any farther, okay? But the likelihood of them connecting right on time is less than one in 400 trillion. One in 400 trillion. It is impossible that you are here. And yet you are. I just think it's the greatest miracle that we are alive. And frequently we yawn our way through life or we curse our way through life or we go kicking and screaming our way all the way through life. And so my ask of you today, regardless of what you're about to do next, is to go through life in awe of what, it, what it remains in front of you and remains within you. Like you, we're, we're, we're treasured gifts. Please don't forget it. It will change the way you feel about COVID-19 and everything else happening around you. John, we have about uh, nine, 10 minutes left. We've got a couple more questions. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, it is real. COVID is real and people are losing their lives over it. What's the best way to comfort friends? Mm. I've, I always find history seems to support me um, in moments of crisis. So there's, there's two things I've done personally and seen done effectively historically. Number one is the power of presence. Uh, I became hospital chaplain in 2004, almost like on a dare. So I just got to hang out with kids for three years who were uh, struggling. And if I tell you any stories, I'll lose it. So I'm not going to tell you any of those stories right now, but they taught me how to live. They, t they showed me an old guy what courage looked like. Um, so what I also learned from them is how inarticulate I am, but in the ability just to come along someone and be with them at their bedside, be with them in the waiting room, be with them in a cafeteria and just being. It was so much better than anything I could have said. I get paid as a speaker these days to say the right things at the right time. But I, I think the most powerful thing we can say is not what we say, but in, in showing up for one another. And the beauty of technology, I mean, I'm looking at all your faces, Dorothy and Diane and Mark and everything. Like, I can see you. You can see me. This is presence. You, none of you have said a word yet that I can hear at least. You're present. I see your face. I see your eyes. I feel your heart. And so don't underestimate the power of your presence to pick up a Zoom call, a FaceTime chat, a handwritten note and say, I see you. I love you. You're not alone. And we're going to get through this thing. We're going to get through this thing. So the power of presence is the first. And then the second to kind of argue against everything I just said is the power of vision. Winston Churchill is one of my heroes and I'm an American, but I, the UK, just, there's a phenomenal history they have. And here they are with their tails between their legs coming back from Dunkirk. The Nazis had just proved to all of Europe who was king of kings at this point. Uh, France was laying down. They just surrendered. The army is coming back on a little pontoon boat, or the, the, right? Shipped across the English Channel. They're bombing London, and Churchill is in the House of Commons, and he he's, gives this magnificent speech. But near the end of it, he says, in a thousand years from today, this island nation will look back on what we did today and say, yes, indeed, this was their finest hour. This was their finest hour. And I don't hear anybody right now championing that in our lives. This was your finest hour. We're hearing, uh, you know, what are you drinking tonight? What are you watching on Netflix tonight? It's like, how are we going to get through this crap stone just before the door is open so I can live my life again? I mean, I want to hear people saying, this is our finest hour. These nurses, the doctors, they're risking their life for us. This is their finest hour. The trash men continue to do their work for about minimum wage. They're risking their lives for us, and they're getting sick in the process. This is their finest hour. The mailman, my father-in-law was a mailman. This is their finest hour. They have not stopped delivery. The ladies in the grocery store somehow are stocking the shelves. God, this is their finest hour. This is our finest hour. So we can be bored by it, or we can say this is our chance. So not only that, let them shine in the light, these men and women who are still working adamantly on our behalf, but also the, those of us who are stuck right now in quarantine. This can be, Michelle, you dropped off 100 love letters today. It's your finest hour. So don't let this hour pass before recognizing that it's a chance for you to harness it. 
finest hour. Well, John, you have been one of the finest hours we've had in the last <laughs> four weeks. I, I want to remind our, our followers, people on the show today, it, you know, think about getting John's new book in awe. And he, no one, no one came on the show because I've said I promote them just so you know, it was a text or a phone call. Hey, I'm thinking about doing something because I keep hearing these words, rhythm and resilience during the reset. You're going to find your new rhythm just as I am finding a new rhythm. And we're going to be resilient. I promise you that we're going to be through this. I, I, I know how the story ends as well. I believe that, especially during this Holy Week. So, John, you have been an inspiration of hope. I would encourage our followers in the chat notes. And um, uh, I'm going to unmute you, unmute you, Eleanor. Eleanor, how can people, what, what's John's site? What is it? So I went ahead and linked um, his podcast and his book in awe in the chat. So you um, are welcome. That'll take you to some of his um, subheadings. John O'Leary inspires.com. Um, and he also has a motivational Monday blog. Um, I noticed. So maybe after this call, we can go check out some of the blog posts. And, we, 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 and once again, we've recorded this, so we're going to send it out to you. I'd encourage you to listen to it with your family or share it with your friends so that we could help put as much good news out there okay. as there is bad news, as much good news as we can. Uh, John, I want to, um, um, once again, celebrate, guide, connect, which provide hope, which you've done that. So awesome. Um, you kicked off the Rhythm and Resilience series. Tomorrow, our listener, our, our, our followers, me, Shemaine Tate, who's an acupuncturist who I've worked with for the last, uh, gosh, uh, 13 years, and she'll be sharing some of her wisdom with you. John, as we close, um, I want to tell you how you've inspired our audience today, because I'm looking at the show notes over here. And, and first of all, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Very, thank you for your time today. Very well spent hour. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Life is morphing into a new normal. We will be great. So much hope. Thank you. Thanks for the lift. Very cool. Thank you, Michelle and John, hearing your words of encouragement. Just a great way to kick off our week. Um, and then amazing conversation today. Thank you for your encouraging words. Um, literally, this is one of the most inspirational things I've had for weeks. <laughs> my encouragement to John is that he has changed my day and my week. Thank you for reorienting mm. my whole focus. I'm in tears reading that, John. And and John, how and, and for once again for our for our people listening today, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, John, I want to tell you how you inspire me. One is you always show up. You take my calls, no matter what it is. I'll be flying through St. Louis and I'll text you, you'll respond back. You surprised me when I was in St. Louis last time and I stopped by your office and you were supposed to be out of town and I got lucky and you weren't, and you were there. Not only were you there, but you have brought breakfast. Um, for your team and I. Um, I just want to tell you, thank you for being a living example of somebody living out God's wisdom on earth today. And it's so awesome to spend Monday with you on Holy Week. So mm. I love you. I see you. And Amen. I appreciate you. Michelle, thank you. And for the listeners, let me just drop a, a, a little encouragement. Uh, two things. One is, if you, if you ever visit readinaw.com, we have a little, like a, a daily challenge to see hope and so uh, consider checking that out read in awe.com i saw some kids in the background and like they're the kind of activities in particular for those of us with little ones at home that they and we might benefit from so if you go to read in awe.com you might enjoy that and then secondly like michelle i'm here to serve so um whether you sign up for the newsletter or podcast or whatever else, like if you ever drop me a note, I'm, I'm the one that responds back. So I'm Michelle's friend and through that, you are her friends. And if I can ever serve you, uh, we are intended to do life together. So I see you guys up at the top of the screen. And for those of you listening, you are following a phenomenal leader in Michelle Robbins. So Michelle, thank you for your light. Uh, I have, uh, I've followed behind you for a long time and I'm grateful for it. All Love right, you guys, marching orders, go out and spread the good. What is your medicine? Send me a little note in this, and we're going to, um, we'll post this on social and, and share in there. What is your medicine? How can you share the love today? Okay, blessings to all of you. We're going to do this. All right, bye, everybody. Thanks, John. I sure appreciate you listening to Small Changes Big Shifts. If you go to the website, smallchangesbigshifts.com, we'll have the show notes ready for you there. If this episode inspired you to make a small change that will lead to a big shift, please share with a friend. 
you can catch our episode on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and our website. And if you feel like it, please leave a rating or a comment. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch our episode next week. Blessings to you.